All right. Remember, yes. Um, so are you going to go over the with Bob James's? Um, yes. All right. So welcome to Math 150 Calc 3. This is lecture 20. And what we're going to be doing today is iterated intervals, you know, changing the order of integration. There are really two fundamental ideas in multivariable calculus. There's switching the order of integration and there's you know, changing variables. So we'll talk a little bit about you know, the polar change of variables, you know, mostly for circles, maybe a little bit for spheres as well today. Uh, in a lot of the lectures that you were supposed to listen to, it goes through some of the theoretical development of where does this number pi come from? And so I'm not gonna go through that. We actually did a lot of that earlier in the semester when we had those review days in the beginning, when we did the inscribed n-gons. So I don't feel so bad about not doing that in great detail here. What I want to do first is, um, well, yeah, I'll start with this one. So I want to integrate over a triangle. And I'm going to give you the following triangle. So this is the line y equals x, or equivalently x equals y. Here's zero, here's one, here's the point one, one. And I want to integrate, x goes from, let's see. So if I want to integrate, and I want to integrate over x first, what should my range of integration be? So if I'm integrating over x first, I fix a value of y. And so what will my range of integration be for x? x goes from where to where? y to 1. And what will the range of y be? So what will y be? What's the smallest y can be? What's the largest y can be? Zero to one. And then I'm going to choose the function x to the fourth e to the x squared y dx dy. Okay. Do you think that this is a completely random function? No, right? This was deliberately chosen to illustrate a point. So when I integrate this with respect to x, y is fixed. So I need to find an antiderivative. So we need an antiderivative with respect to x of x to the fourth e to the x squared y. So what function would have that as its derivative? Yeah. What might you try? Well, as soon as you have x to the third y, you've now got the wrong thing in the exponent. So whatever I do, I've got to have e to the x squared y as my exponent here. If I do this, when I take the derivative of x to the five, I'm going to get an x to the fourth, which is great. But then I'm also going to get, when I take the derivative, I will get an x to the fourth e to the x squared y but I'll also get an x to the fifth over five. And then when I take the derivative with respect to x, I'm going to get a two x y e to the x squared y. So this is looking bad. You can keep trying and keep trying and keep trying, and it's just not gonna work. There is no nice antiderivative. There is an antiderivative of this function but it involves a new special function, which is given by an infinite sum. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. So if you try to do this, you know, step one, if I'm doing the x integration, I need to know the antiderivative. I don't know the antiderivative, I'm stuck. What can we do? Two acceptable answers. Change the order, right? You're given that this is a lecture on changing the order of integration, 
Changing the order is one possibility. There is one other thing we could do. This is the 21st century. What can you do if you're stuck on a problem? Yeah, use a calculator, use an online website like Wolfram Alpha or something like that, right? So let's change the order. So if I change the order, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix a value of X and I'm going to have Y move up like this. And so I want the integral X goes from integral Y goes from, and my function is going to be X to the fourth e to the x squared y dy dx. All right, so if I fix x, what does y go from? Y goes from what's wrong? Zero to x. You know, so if you look, if I fix a value of x, I start off at the x-axis and I rise until I get to the point x. So y goes from zero to x. Now, what is X range from? What's the smallest value of X? What's the largest value of X? Zero to one. And so now I want to do this integral. All right, so what is the integral? Y goes from zero to X of, now I've got X to the fourth e to the X squared Y dy. How should I write x to the fourth e to the x squared y dy to make things easy? Remember, integrating with respect to y, so x is a constant. Almost surely there's a nice way to do this because I'm using this to illustrate the concept of changing orders can help. So if I had e to the x squared y, think if I had e to the seven y, what would you like to have? You wouldn't want to have dy, you would want to have, if I had e to the seven y, I would want to have, if you want to integrate e to the seven y, it would be better not to just have dy, but to have, I be you. I mean, you could do it by u substitution. What would you be? If I have e to the seven y, you would equal seven y. So I don't want dy, I would want seven dy. If I had e to the 15 y, what would I want? I want 15 y dy. Well, I can just multiply by 15 and divide by 15. If I had e to the smiley face y, I would want smiley face dy. I have e to the x squared y. What do I want in front of the dy to do my change of variables? I want x squared. So let me write this as x squared. I can pull an x squared outside the integral because the integral is a function, is I'm integrating with respect to y, x is constant. And then I have the integral, y goes from zero to x, e to the x squared y, x squared dy. So if I let u be x squared y, du is x squared dy, y goes from zero to x, u is going to go from what to what? So if y goes from zero to x, what would you go from? So u is x squared y. When y equals zero, what is u equal? Zero. zero. And now u is x squared y. So when y equals x, what is x squared y equal? X cubed. So this is just going to be x squared, the integral u goes from zero to x cubed, e to the u du. Oh, okay, well, what's the integral of e to the u du? What function has derivative e to the u? e to the u. So this is just going to be x squared e to the u at zero and x cubed, okay? So that's going to just be x squared e to the x cubed minus x squared. So our integral 
equals the integral x goes from zero to one. Remember, um, we had the x squared outside, the x squared is step, so it's going to become x squared e to the x cubed minus x squared dx. Does everyone agree that this is the integral that we are left having to compute? Yes? Okay. The wonders of cut and paste are pasted over to the next page. And so we want to calculate this. Well, okay, I can split this into two integrals. This is the integral x goes from zero to one, e to the x cubed, x squared dx minus the integral x goes from zero to one of x squared dx. I want to do this, the first one a little bit quickly. You could do a u substitution. If you did a u substitution, what would you let u be for the first one? So if you did the u substitution for the first one, you have e to the x cubed x squared dx. What would you want u to be? x cubed, right? You would take u to be x cubed, du would be three x squared dx. X goes from zero to one, gives us u goes from zero to one. I could also just write it as one third integral x goes from zero to one, e to the x cubed, three x squared dx minus the integral x goes from zero to one of x squared dx. And again, if you're not comfortable doing this, do the u substitution, write it down explicitly as you get older and older and older. And I have done these integrals longer than you've been alive. At some point, you've done them so many times, you don't have to write down all the steps. And if you feel comfortable, by all means, do it a little quickly. And now I can say, okay, I've got basically e to the u du, and so this is going to just become uh, one third e to the x cubed at zero and one minus x cubed over three at zero and one. Okay. And so this is going to become one third e to the one minus one third e to the zero, which is minus a third, and I have minus a third over here, so it's just one third e minus two thirds, or one third e minus two. Any questions on how we did this? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, well, so I guessed exactly how many pages I would need to do this problem. And I had the following set up on the next slide. So I asked Mathematica to integrate x to the fourth uh, e to the x squared y x. And I told and the, the comma x at the end means integrate this as a function of x. And Mathematica thought about it and it gave me you know, e to the x cubed y x times a polynomial of the four y squared times something involving e f r i which is the imaginary error function. And then I told it to do the double integral. So integrate, integrate. And the first one I said, do with the integral first with respect to x, and then integrate with respect to y. The other one was I first had to do it with respect to y, and then with respect to x. Given our experience in class, which do you think should be easier? The second. And so Mathematica has a wonderful function called timing, which tells you how long it takes to do something. The second one, it basically got in 0 0.03 seconds. The first one, it actually, you know, 1.625, I got it. It actually figured out how to do things. So I'm not entirely sure because Mathematica is a black box program. You do not know the algorithms it's using, but it figured out what the integral was. And in both cases, we get you know, e minus two over three, the same answer we got. So, you know, to me, this is just a real epiphany as a professor as to what is the value that I'm at. You know, we've now reached the point where it's able to do the interchange of integration. So the main job we have 
as you go further and further, is knowing how to program the computer. So there's lots of science fiction stories where the whole point is learning how do you pose the problem well so that the computer can ch chug. Now you want to have some idea of is the answer reasonable? Does this answer look reasonable? Well, what can you tell me about the answer? So the answer is e minus two over three, and we were integrating over the triangle uh, x to the fourth e to the x squared y dA. I'll just do dA. What can you tell me before you do any of the integration? What should be true about the value of this integral? Integral should be what? Okay, why between zero and one half? Okay, the total area is one half. What's the largest the function could be? So what's the largest x to the fourth e to the x squared y can be on this triangle? Mm -hmm. E. So you're close. It's not between zero and one half. It's between zero and e over two. Integral should be, I'm going to just do something weaker first. It should be positive. That's the weakest thing I can say. I'm integrating something that's non-negative. Except, okay, at, at the, when x equals zero, two. But other than that, it's positive. So my answer should be a positive number. Better is it should be between zero times one half and e times one half. And this is the minimum value, and this is the maximum value. All right, we've got e minus two over three. That is definitely between zero and e over two. So some quick smell tests, it seems to pass. Um, we could do things a little bit better even. E to the x squared y is how large? What's the largest e to the x squared y could be? It's at most e. So maybe say the integral is less than equal to e times the integral of x to the fourth dA, right? Because I know the exponential is at most e, and now I could do an x to the fourth. So I'll leave that as an exercise for you to try to get a little better sense of you know, what would be a good bound for this. Is I know my integrand is at most e times x to the fourth. Okay, so if I integrate um, x to the fourth over this, that's going to give me a better estimate than just saying it's the largest value everywhere. So if you take the largest value everywhere, it's going to give you a bound, but it's not necessarily going to be the tightest bound. This is a better bound. Is I know it's at most x to the fourth times e everywhere. I'm not dropping the x to the fourth back. But you know, again, Mathematica is now able to do this. So then the question becomes, you know, what is the value added? You know, what are we you know, trying to learn here? So you know, the big thing is you know, iterated integrals is changing the order of integration. In Mathematica, you know, when we're doing something like that, all that really means is, well, if I integrate it, if it doesn't work, try it the other way. There is, I believe, a direct command. Um, I have not done that, so let me do this with you now. X squared Y. X. Actually, no, I'm, not, I'm actually not sure how to, I only know how to program the double integrals directly if it's over a rectangular region. I'm not sure how to do it over a triangular region, so I'm not going to try to do that now. I'll just leave it as uh, we have seen uh, that we can just do it as integrate, integrate, and we have two different ways of doing it. And if one way doesn't work, switch and try the other. Okay. So this is one of the two major techniques of integration. The other is changing variables. And as an example, 
I would like to go back to probably one of the most hated and most forgotten aspects of Algebra 2. How many of you remember your conic sections? If you have a cone, and if you have a plane slicing it parallel to the base, you get a circle. If it goes vertically, you get parabolas. If it comes in at one kind of angle, you get an ellipse. If it comes in another way, you can get hyperbolas. All these conic sections are wonderful. And you might get you know, for an ellipse, if I have it oriented like this, where here is A minus A, B, I'm sorry, minus B and B, this is X over A squared plus Y over B squared equals one. And the definition of an ellipse is it's all points whose sum of the distance from the two foci is constant. So there's a nice geometric interpretation for all of these. If you're doing physics and if you're doing mirrors, a lot of mirrors are parabolic. So for parabola, you have a line, which is the directrix. You have a focus, and these are the foci. And a parabola is all points equidistant from the focus and the directrix. So those two lines have the same length. So if this is D, that's also D. And you might remember like the formula one over four P X squared, something like that. So there's a nice geometric interpretation for all of these. All right, so this is the formula for an ellipse. How many people vaguely remember or more seeing something like this in high school? Okay. What if I decide to be you know, a real jerk and give you an ellipse oriented like this, where it's no longer aligned with the coordinate axis. Did you cover in school how to do this? So here's how you do this. Basically, you say, screw that. I'm going to do a different problem. I'm going to change coordinates. I'm going to basically just lean back. If I lean back into the green coordinate system, it's now an ellipse aligned with the coordinate axis. And so in the green system, it's actually very easy. So if I call the green system, say, x prime, y prime, and call that a, call that b, I would get x prime over a squared plus y prime over b squared equals 1. So the ellipse is very easy to understand in this new coordinate system. And then you convert from x prime, y prime to x, y. This is linear algebra. So this is the most natural class to take after this class. And you're, we're getting to the point where you want to figure out, well, what do I want to do after this? Linear algebra steps, you know, these are two very natural classes to take after this. Linear algebra is all about finding what is the right framework, what is the right coordinate system to look at the problem. You know, I've said this before, as a Bostonian, what one thing do I have to tip my hat to part of New York? The grid in Manhattan. If you're trying to talk about distances and traveling in Manhattan, you would always choose to orient your coordinate axes with the north, south, east, west streets, you know, with the avenues and the streets. It makes perfect sense. It's a beautiful grid. For this problem, the most natural coordinate system is not the one that aligns with the x-y axis, but the ones that align with the ellipse. In that coordinate system, it's very easy. And then I just have to figure out, how do I go from x prime, y prime to x, y? And linear out it teaches us how to do that very easily. So you probably have not done this in high school. Absolutely fine that you didn't do this, but this is the beginning of changing variables. And this is something that you should be aware of that depending on what problem you're looking at, different symmetries will tell you that you should look at different things. So for some things, I can't hide it. If I give you something on a sphere, what kind of coordinate system do you think I should use? Spherical. If I give you something on a circle, I should use Polar, yeah, it's not a little bit hard. You have to say polar and not circular. But if you say circular, yeah, it'll be accepted. Right? So let's try to figure out 
Cartesian to Paul. And so remember, we have X equals R cosine theta, Y equals R sine theta, or R is the square root of X squared plus Y squared, and theta is arctangent of Y over X. So again, you know, I've got my point over here. Here's R, here's theta, here's the point X, Y. Okay. So I've just got a warning that my internet connection is unstable. So anybody in internet land is having trouble, then feel free to call me if there's an issue. Okay. When my brother graduated from college, uh, he went to Georgia Tech. His graduation speaker was Newt Gingrich. And he said something that was fascinating. When he was young, uh, he was growing up on an army base in Europe. And you had to worry about having the right money when you travel. Has anybody here traveled to another country? Have you ever bought anything in another country? Have you carried cash for that other country? Or did you use your credit card or both? How many people have used a credit card in another country? Yeah, the bank just charges you a very reasonable amount of uh, your conversion, but you don't have to worry about having local currency. You can just travel anywhere and it's just, here's my credit card, you deduct money from it. It's absolutely amazing. It hides a little bit what's going on, but you have a way to convert from dollars to euros or dollars to yen or whatever. And so this is what we're going to have to do now is we're going to have to do an exchange rate. I want to convert from a Cartesian system and what an infinitesimal area segment is there to a polar system and what is an infinitesimal section there. So in a Cartesian system, you know, I drop things like this and I have my little boxes. Wow, what a long delay. The internet connection really is unstable. Okay. And so, you know, this might be my delta x, this would be my delta y. And so the area here is delta x, delta y. I could also look at things in a polar system. So in a polar system, what I'll do is I'll have a bunch of angles coming out like this. And I'll have a bunch of you know, radii of different lengths. And then I want to figure out what is the area of each infinitesimal patch? And so, let's say this length over here is going to be delta r. Okay. Now, what do I think? This arc is going to be over here. What is that length going to be? Wow, it still hasn't shown it. Okay, there we go. All right, so we've got delta R over here. And now what we want to do is we want to figure out what is the length of the little bit of an arc you're coming up on circle from here to here. Okay, so any thoughts about what that length is going to be? So one possibility is d theta, or delta theta, because we're using a small infinitesimal. Now, if we did delta theta, what would the area of that small little patch be? It'd be delta r delta theta. Does delta r delta theta make sense as an area? Why not? Yeah, the units are wrong. So I got in trouble in a advanced math class as an undergraduate when we did an integral. And I said, you professor, the integral is wrong. The units don't work. What? I'm sorry. It has the wrong degree of homogeneity in the premise. Oh, yes. Every subject has their own language. I love to put things in terms of units. So for me, I'm thinking in terms of meters, area should be meters. Delta R is going to be meters. 
Delta theta is an infection. It's universe, it's radiant. So delta r delta theta is going to have units of energy. If I want to figure out the measurement of an arc, the measurement of an arc of an arc of not delta theta, what is it? It's r d. And the r d theta, this is why we use radiant, because a whole circle is going to be too high. And so if the whole circle is too high, then if you just go a fraction of it, it's going to be the length is delta theta over two pi times two pi r. So let's still get an unstable internet connection. Okay, so I'm about to go to plan B. I want to move a little bit. Look at the move. I would turn this around, but the internet connection is unstable, and I I can't display it. And after what happened earlier today, I really do not want to pause and turn things off. So, so the length is going to be delta theta over two pi times two pi r. So it's going to just be R delta theta. So the area, the area is R delta theta delta R. Okay. So the delta R delta theta is not quite the area, it's R delta theta delta r. So now in the limit, you know, delta theta goes to d theta, delta r goes to dr. And so dx dy is basically going to be the same as r d theta dr or r dr d theta. We can do it either way. We normally like to do R D R D theta to just put the R's together. But you should really view it as R D theta because R D theta is the length. Okay. So let's try to think of an object where we might want to calculate a uh, function using polar coordinates. Anybody think of a good object do we might want to study using polar coordinates? A circle. And what's the simplest function to consider over a circle? When we're there, that's the equation of the circle. What's the simplest function to integrate over the circle? One. And so if we integrate one over the circle, what should we get? We should get pi. And if we do a circle of radius big R, we should get pi R squared. So let's do. You know, a circle of radius big R. So if we were to do things, you know, this, this is, you know, Y is equal to, you know, plus or minus the square root of R squared minus X squared. It's going to be the plus if we're in the top half, it's going to be the minus if we're in the bottom half. And so the integral we would have to do is the integral Y goes from, um, I'm sorry. Uh, and I have to go over here to hit Control Z. So I would have the integral x goes from minus one to one. Integral y goes from minus the square root of r squared minus x squared to the square root of r squared minus x squared of one dy dx. Well, the y integral is easy. What's the integral of one dy? Yeah. Yeah. 
one. I'm sorry. The integral of one dy is y. And so we would then get the integral x goes from minus one to one of two square roots of r squared minus, x. oh, I'm sorry, x goes from minus r to r, sorry. dx. So we would now have to do this integral. And to do this integral, we would probably do trig substitution. Okay. Let's look at now you know, the integral over the circle in polar. So we want to integrate the function one dx dy becomes r dr d theta. So if I'm writing r dr d theta, which do I integrate first, the r or the theta? Which integral is done first, which integral is done second? Yeah, you, you read from the inside out. So dr comes first, so we do the dr first. And this is why I often put in these brackets here. So little r is going to go from zero to big R. And what's theta going to go from? Zero to two pi. So what's nice is in polar coordinates, what does a circle look like? Circle looks just like a rectangle. And not only does it look like a rectangle, but my integrand doesn't have r and theta mixed up in a bad way. If I had e to the theta r, you know, I can't just split it up as two different integrals. But because the integral is split nicely, this is the same as I can integrate theta goes from 0 to 2 pi of d theta, integral r goes from 0 to r of r dr. If you're not comfortable with this, just do the R integration first. And then you see that that has absolutely no theta dependence. So it's not going to affect the theta integral at all. That's why we can essentially just pull that outside the integral. That's essentially what we're doing here. All right, what is the theta integral equal? What's the integral of d theta from zero to two pi? So what would be the integral of d theta from zero to two pi? Just two pi. You know. The antiderivative is theta, we evaluated two pi, so part gets zero. This is just going to be two pi. Now we have to integrate r. What function is derivative of r? R squared over two. R squared. So r2 d2, r squared divided by two, right? And we evaluate that at zero and r. So we get two pi r squared over two or pi r squared. And so we get the area of a circle of radius r is pi r squared. Should we be ecstatic that this is a huge win? Why is this not something to really celebrate? Well, if you think about what we're assuming, we're assuming things about perimeters and areas of circles when we're coming up with this exchange rate. So I'm not really that surprised that it gave me the right answer. So we need to do a more interesting problem. So can anybody give me a nice shape that lives above a circle? Yes. You could do an ellipse, but there's a nicer shape than an ellipse. Yes. Half a sphere, or we can even do the whole sphere. We can do the top and the bottom, right? If I take my you know, equator and I have the sphere, you know, the height is going to be my z, right? And I can just calculate the area, the volume, and I will get the volume of the sphere. So let's try to do that. So volume of a sphere. So this is x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than equal to r squared. So if I give you a value of x and y, fix x and y, z goes from negative square root of r squared minus x squared plus y squared to the square root of r squared minus x squared plus y squared. 
So I want to integrate over the circle. So the height is just going to be double that. I'm basically just doing the z integral immediately because the z integral is no z dependence. I just go from minus to plus, so it's going to be twice. So this is just going to be my height, two square roots of r squared minus x squared plus y squared dA. And I'm integrating over the circle. And I could write down what the bounds of integration are. This would be very similar to what I had a moment ago, where I first say, I, let's let you know, maybe x go from minus r to r, and then y is going to go from the square roots of other. It's going to be messy. Let's convert this to polar. So when we convert this to polar, I now have r dr d theta. So what are the bounds? Um, what are the bounds for the R integration? R goes from what to what? So you get, here's my circle. It's got radius R. Not negative big R, we're close. Zero. Just zero. The radius never goes into negatives. We always take into account the negatives by having theta go from zero to two pi. So R goes from zero to big R. What does theta go from? So what's theta going to go from? zero to two pi. And now what I have to do is I have to take my integrand and I have to replace X with our cosine theta and Y with our sine theta. So replace X with our cosine theta, Y with our sine theta. I, and when I do that, what is R squared minus X squared plus Y squared going to be? So what will x squared plus y squared equal? R squared. Just little r squared. So it's just going to be the integral of r squared minus little r squared. So this is the same as the integral theta goes from 0 to 2 pi of d theta. And then you can pull up the 2. Little r goes from 0 to r r squared minus little r squared to the one half r dr. I claim the theta integral is very easy to do. What is the theta integral going to do? Two pi, and we have a two outside. So we're going to get four pi integral r goes from zero to big r, r squared minus little r squared to the one half r dr. Does anybody remember the formula for the volume of a sphere? Four thirds pi r cubed. Four thirds pi r cubed. This is actually looking pretty good. I've got a four pi. Now r squared minus little r squared, that's going to be meters squared. I raise it to the half power that's going to be meters. I multiply by little r, that's meters. I multiply by dr, that's another meters. Okay, so I do look like I have a meters cubed. This is looking good. So I get that the volume is equal to four pi integral, little r goes from zero to big R, r squared minus little r squared to the one half r dr. Anybody want to give me an idea of how we might try to do this integration? What can we do? Well, isn't big R just a constant? Big R is just constant, but remember we have a square root. Where you can do your substitution. So what would you take for you? Yes. And this is where we live well. When you have 
the square root of r squared minus little r squared, you want a 2r to, to appear at some point. And we don't have a 2r, but we have an r. 2r is just being a little bit too greedy. The fact of 2 doesn't really make much of a difference. I can always multiply by 2, divide by half. I was like, multiply by 2, divide by 2, not a big deal. The r, that's what's really important. And we have that over here. So if u is equal to this, what is du dr equal to? It's just gonna be negative two r. So du is negative two r dr, or r dr is negative one half du. And again, I'm doing it very slowly to minimize the chance of making a mistake when I substitute. I know I have an r dr, so why don't I just write things explicitly so I can substitute directly for r dr? Now, little r goes from zero to big R. So what does u go from? When little r equals zero, what is u? Or r squared. And when little r equals big R, what is u? Zero. So we get that the volume is equal to four pi integral u goes from r squared to zero. Now we're going to have a u to the one half times negative one half du, right? So this is the same as four pi times one half integral u goes from zero to r squared, u to the one half, actually, I'm going to keep the one half inside the integral. And I use the negative sign to switch the order of integration. Okay. I have u to the one half times one half du. What function has derivative u to the one half times one half? Yeah, no, this is good. So what function has derivative u to the one half times one half u? One third. Yes, one third u to the three halves. And when the three halves comes down and hits the one third, I'm gonna get a one half. So it's one third u to the three halves evaluated zero and big R squared. So we get four pi over three r squared to the three halves. And from the laws of exponents, r squared to the three halves is r to the two times three halves. So now we get four pi over three r cubed. So I will view this now as a success. Yes. We've now found the volume of a sphere from integrating over uh, a circle. How many of you have heard of tau day? So there's a group of people who believe that pi does not merit being celebrated, that two pi, the perimeter, is the more fundamental constant than the area. And depending on how you look at things, I think it's a very compelling case. If you've done electricity and magnetism, and who are my physics people? You might remember in some of the formulas for electricity, the constant is one over four pi epsilon naught. The four pi is coming from where do you think the four pi is coming from? Geometrically, where do you see four pi related to things involving circles? So we just did the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi. What's the surface area? It's four pi r squared. The four pi in those formulas in physics is coming from the surface area. All right, so this is a good place to stop for today.